Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the latest episode of Unstoppable. I'm your host, Kerwin Ray, and today we talk all things property and wealth with my good friend, Chris Gray. He started with just $35,000 at the age of 22 investing in property. Now, he has a property portfolio worth over $15 million, which provides him an income that has allowed him to semi-retire. The thing I love about Chris is he focuses on lifestyle first, business second. So he has built his entire business and his income around the lifestyle that he has chosen. But what's interesting is what is wealth these days? Most people don't even know where to start. Once upon a time, half a million dollars or a million dollars was considered wealthy. Well, let me tell you, it might be in for a little bit of a surprise when you find out what is actually considered wealth today and how much is actually required in order to live off the passive income and enjoy the lifestyle that he does. Here he drives Lamborghinis, he flies in helicopters. This guy has holidays all over the world. He actually literally has turned his weekdays into weekends. This is one you are not going to want to miss. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Gray, listen up. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an absolute pleasure to welcome to the studio Christopher Gray. How are you, mate? What a great title for a show. Thanks I for know. having me on. We had you in mind when we came up with the name. Mate, yeah. I'll do my best to uh, to perform. Do your best to perform and and, uh, and represent. Mate, great to have you here. Pleasure. Uh, I feel very honoured. Uh, I'm in a very um, privileged position. I know a little bit about who you are and what you do. For, but for those people who don't know who you are uh, and what you do with Empire, just give people a little bit of a, a, a quick blurb. Who are you? What do you do? Sure. So I'm generally reasonably well known in the property industry for being a property investor and within that community is being contrarian. So I typically do the opposite to what most other people do. Right. So to give you a start, right from an early age, 22, I couldn't afford a one bedroom unit at three times my income, but I could afford a three bedroom house seven times my income because I basically worked out the mathematics that I could rent two rooms out and it pay my whole mortgage. So suddenly one bedroom unit, mortgage for life would have no money. Now I had the best bachelor pad in town, live for free, and I think I made two years' salary overnight by buying well. And so at this early age, even though I was doing studying accounting and I've kind of worked during the day and study at night, I got this magic and I, I did the same thing. I repeated again at 23 and I thought there's got to be something in this. And I think that the, uh, the next year at 24, I basically worked out how to use the equity to get a Porsche. I couldn't afford a Porsche on a three-year lease, but I could afford one out of the equity. So I had a free house, free Porsche, and a free investment property. And I thought, <laughs> there's, there's something in this. I'm not that, you know, I'm not that smart, but well, if I, I'm very good at getting the math to work something yeah. my way. Well, if we judge the fish uh, based on its, its ability to climb a tree, its intelligence on its ability to climb a tree, we wouldn't think it's very smart. But if there's one thing that I know you're very good at is getting things to pay for themselves. Um, and again, and I wasn't going to go here so quickly, but you're also really famously known for being able to not only buy a Lamborghini, but to actually make it a good investment. You're the only person I know, in fact, that can buy a Lamborghini and make a good investment. Well, the Lamborghini actually pays me. So <laughs> yes, it's, it's an appreciating <laughs> asset. And so my only thing now is, so I basically bought a 750 grand car, but for 250, because it was maybe eight years old, a uh, 2005 Merce Lago, if there's any fanatics out there. And basically a few years later, I went to get it reinsured and someone at the Lambo Club said, hey, that's probably worth 350 now. And I said, no, there's no way. Spoke to Shannon's the insurance company. They came back two years or two days later and said, yeah, we've uh, increased the value to 350 in case it gets um, kind of burned out or something goes wrong with it. So I said to my wife, I should have bought three cars and then I would have made $300,000. And so so my skill is, is I set goals mm. of what I want to achieve mm. and then I can manipulate numbers legally, of course, yep. to make to make it work. But you don't just do this with, with the properties and the cars. You do this with holidays and you know, you're, you're the only person I know that literally travels the world. It's almost like you're on this, uh, this endless summer of holidays, but you're actually kind of working. So I'm well, that's probably what... one of the most hated people around. <laughs> so I just flown in from Hong Kong yesterday and one of the Sky News uh, readers I know over there, she said, I keep feeling like uh, defriending you on Facebook because you're just so annoying. <laughs> so basically in the last three months I've been to uh, Japan for a conference. Then I flew in for Singapore and I told a friend invited me to the Grand Prix and I said I haven't got time. But when is it? And I worked out I was actually there by coincidence for the Friday, Saturday, so I just extended for the finals. Came back for a few days, then went to Bali for a week, back for about a week, and then just been in Hong Kong doing some seminars over there. And now Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane tour, and then off to Thailand for a strategy week uh, in about 10 days' time. And making money all the way through. I do what I can. But, I mean, my whole thing is, so my investment strategy is very much passive. Yeah. So I've roughly got 15 million of property. 
I personally believe it will go up five or ten percent a year. So I think passively I earn roughly seven fifty to one and a half million, not every year, but over the long term. So almost whatever my business does is almost irrelevant. I run my business for serviceability to get me the loans and it pays for my travel and my cars and, and all the other fun things that I do. And I only do something if it's fun. Mm. So like today, I'm doing this because I enjoy it and I enjoy your company, <laughs> Kevin. I've got that on video and now I can, uh, I can prove <laughs> it to the world. Why do you believe that so many people struggle to build any kind of wealth? Sure. And to look, to put it into perspective, I'm not super wealthy and I'm not the, I don't get the biggest financial returns in life. I guess what I'm more about is I've got this work-life balance thing mm. almost to a T and that's what people stand for is sure I earn a lot of money. I've got a lot of assets. I could be worth maybe 50 or a hundred million, but I choose not to because I'd rather have say 10 or 20 million to, to earn a quarter of a million, half a million and to do all the things I want to do than be worth twice as much and work 80 hours a week. Mm. And that's the balance. I think most people are too greedy or they're too hung up into career yep. that that's all they're driving for. And I think this is where with wealth as well is so many people are into their career because it's social status and what the Joneses think and the neighbours and sending your kids to the right school. They're so into that they don't have time to put things into wealth. Yeah. So I, I literally meet thousands of people every year and talk to them about money and I interview them about what money they earn, what assets they've got. And even people on half a million, million dollars a year, a lot of them have got nothing. Mm. So they might live in that, say if you're in Sydney, that Mosman household or the Vaucluse, big house, keeping up with the Joneses and all the other partners at the accounting firms. You've got your two kids at private school, you've got brand new cars, you've maybe got a partner that's not working, you go on your holidays a couple of times a year and you go business class because you've worked so hard and you've got a one or two million dollar mortgage and you've got no money. Mm -hmm. And no one's showing it, no one's saying anything, but they've got no money. Mm. And it doesn't matter because my kids are going to the right school and I'm seen to be doing the right thing. I'm driving the right car. Yeah. And the UK was a big show of that. So, so I was born in the UK. Is when a new car came out, I think on the 1st of August, it came out with a letter of the alphabet. So the big thing was is if you had the new car that was like an H plate or an F or whatever the, the number was, the letter was of that uh, that year, that was the social standing in the street. Ah, oh, John Smith across the road, he's just got a brand new car because everyone can tell from that number plate. Yeah, right. Whereas in Australia, you can't, unless you really know your cars, you can't tell. So that so, social status isn't there as much, which, okay. which I quite like. Wealth is something that seems to be changing. You know, it's it's evolving in terms of what is wealth and what does wealth look like in today's modern world. Once upon a time, a million dollars seemed to be the you know the be all and end all. If someone would be wealthy, if they had a million dollars, that seemed to be the magic number. Uh, but what we now know, you know, a million dollars in today's world isn't going to get you very far. What does wealth look like today? How much do you need to need to be either having assets or in cash or an in income in order to be considered wealthy today? I literally did a seminar about two hours ago and one of the questions said to me was, how many people at school that wanted to marry a millionaire? Like you'd be so happy if you managed to marry a millionaire or a millionaireess. What if you marry one now? Oh, he's poor. I'm going to have to go out to work to support my other half because he's only a millionaire. <laughs> so look, I, th I think it depends where you, you come from around the world, but I would say a reasonable millionaire these days is probably 10 mil. Right. Um, and that's of assets, whether it's net assets or total assets, I think it, that's roughly the number. And look, I'd say a good income these days is probably 250 to 500 grand. Now, yep. there's some people out there that might be on 50 or 100 thinking you're full of it, whatever, like 100 grand, you should be grateful. And I, I firmly believe in that. Most of my portfolio, I earn less than 80,000 a year as an accountant. Yeah, right. So I talk about money and wealth all the time, but I'm not actually hung up on it. And so I think a lot of people that actually know me say, well, you're actually quite down to earth. We see this this kind of persona and it's all money, 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 but it it's not with me. Like my yeah. car's, was it 12 years old? I live in a rental, so I, I don't even own my own home and I don't want to own my own home. So I talk about these numbers flippantly, but I think whether you earn 100 grand or 500 or a million, you can be a lot wealthier on a 100 grand salary mm. because the people at 500 and a million, they assume they're going to be wealthy because they're successful. But in reality, they do nothing with their money. Whereas I think the 100 grand person or the 50 grand person thinks, hey, I don't earn a lot, I'm, I'm poor, mm. and they get their money working harder. Is that and right? I, I saw this in my 30s at Deloitte's. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, that's really interesting. So, you know, 
when we talk about wealth and retirement, how much does one need now to in order to retire comfortably and what is comfortable in today's economics? Sure. So normally you'd think that, say, if you had a million bucks, you might get a 5% return on it. So say 50 grand a year and you maybe pay some tax on that. So you just need to think, well, how much do I need to live on? What's my outgoings every year? Assuming maybe a house is paid off and then multiply it by those millions at that kind of maybe 3 to 5% or so. So... I think for a lot of people, if you live in an expensive city like Sydney, Melbourne, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, you you need a lot of money to retire, Mm. which is why most people don't. They're still working in their 65s um, because you need a lot of money to live these days. And we're all, we've all got phones, we're all traveling around the world a lot easier. So, and the, the thing I learned at 31 when I got out of work is if you do a normal nine to five or work 50 or 60 hours a week, there's a limit to how many hours you can spend. If you haven't got a job, you've got twenty four seven to spend. Yeah, right. So you need even more money, effectively. Mm, mm, that's a good point. But saying that, I think a lot of people, if you get a lot of these world trips and all your bucket lists done while you're working, I think it's a good thing because then when it comes to retirement, you don't necessarily need to buy that brand new Ferrari or Lamborghini or a $10 million home because at that age, the kids are left home, you're downsizing, you're more comfortable with a maybe an apartment, and suddenly you've got nothing to prove. And so, like, I live in an apartment now. Before I needed a massive house, we never used any of it. It was a complete waste of space. Mm. I don't need three lounge rooms, two dining rooms. So, so many people do these things to keep up with the Joneses, whereas, who cares? Be comfortable in yourself and don't worry about it. And what percentage of people retire broke? I'd say the majority of people. I once once saw a statistic. This is going back, oh, gosh, I think it was in 2003, it said that 97 point something, I, was not, I think it was 97.3% of the people roughly retire. I think on under 40 grand or something like yeah. that. And look, it was probably 10 years ago. But look, those kind of stats, as you know, like 78.2 are, are made up anyway. <laughs> but um, 78.3. Um, but it is a general thing is most people aren't wealthy and most people will carry on working forever. And what, most people's idea of a wealth creation strategy is just making sure that they pay their super, you know, yeah. chip into their super. But and is the that actually going to be worth nothing? Right, it's, it's 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 ridiculous. So for someone who thinks that their superannuation is their is their wealth creation strategy, what would you say to them? Wake up! Right, you really do need to because again, you're putting nine percent in or whatever it is, and people might have a few hundred grand. A few hundred grand doesn't last long unless you really are on bread and water and you're you're not into any material things. But to me, retirement's about living the life and going Mm. off and enjoying these things. And I'm thinking even pre-retirement because what I've learned very, very kind of recently in the last few years is I keep hearing of almost once a week someone having cancer, strokes, heart attacks. The chances of surviving these things is is pretty high these days. And your ability to go and do stuff is, is less and less. So if you really want to travel the world and you want to bungee jump or race car or do whatever, sail around the world, you need to be doing it in your 30s and 40s. You're not mm. going to be fit enough in your 60s. I mean, maybe med- medicine's going to change. But I recently had um, an eye test and so I've started wearing like reading glasses now and they said, so I'm 46, oh, as soon as you hit your 40s, it get worse and worse and I can see it dramatically changing. And I had an eye operation and I did a presentation that night and I said, something could have gone wrong and I couldn't see. If I can't see, how can I do my cars, the boats, all this fun stuff I love doing, it takes one little thing to suddenly lose your eyesight Mm. or to have cancer or heart attack, and then you can't do all these things. So you've got to do it today. Yeah, right. And that's one of the things I've really admired about you. You don't wait. And I'll say this again, that I have admired about you. Thank you. uh, Is you don't wait. Um, And one of the things, and I hope you don't mind me saying this, like I I actually saw a significant shift in you when when your dad passed away. Like after your dad passed away, I I saw you really, um, you know, take the lesson of mortality. and And I saw you, and you already lived a pretty, you know, large life as it was. But when your dad passed away, did that make you reassess, you know, perhaps what the, the important things were in life? Yeah, so look, I've always been kind of reasonably materialistic and, and into lifestyle anyway. Yeah. So my dad went to Cambridge. He was a heart physician, so like super clever. Yeah. And I'm the kind of the lazy son that didn't want to go to university and does the minimum. <laughs> <laughs> Became an accountant. Going. Yeah, because um, I can't stand blood. Um, so I've always been that kind of person anyway, but I push the limits even more. So I think last month I was in town like three nights of the month. 
and look, part of it's having an understanding partner. So my my wife's a speaker as well. She understands that as a speaker, when you get engagements, you can't pick and choose when you want to do it. Like mm. this week, I'm doing seven speaking things, but I might go a whole month and do nothing. Yeah, right. And so, as long as you're doing the stuff you enjoy, like what is work? So people say, how often do you do you work? My wife might say 50 or 60 hours a week, or he's always on the job seven days. People like you and the others will say, I don't I work. Don't I don't ever see him work. You never see me work. <laughs> so, but, but that's, that's the amazing thing, is, thing. You've been able to integrate work and life as if it were one in the aspect of what most people would consider to be a pretty bloody incredible lifestyle. You know, there is no work-life balance for you. It's just one thing. You're not Because yeah. it's not like one thing on here, One th- you're not balancing on either side. These two are really enmeshed together. Yeah. So... So my biggest thing when I left Deloitte's was I only wanted to do the things I want to enjoy, which mm. to me is the biggest luxury. So the biggest luxury is not money, it's freedom and choice. Yep. To do what you want to do with who you want, when you want. Yep. Within reason. I, I kind of put that on. And so I've got no office because I thought you've got to turn up. I've got no staff because you've got to pay staff. If you're lucky, they turn up to work. If you're, luck- you're really lucky, they do some work. And if you're super lucky, they don't see you. So... <laughs> Sure, I've got people that work for me, but they're contractors and they basically run their own business under my brand. So if they want to earn money, they've got to turn up and do something. And it's not even how many hours they turn up. It's all on results. Mm. And so suddenly I don't have to motivate my team because if they want to get paid and they want to eat and they want a good life, they want an even better life, you work harder. But it's actually get results. Mm. And the great thing I love about speaking is you can speak to... A 1,000 people or 10,000 people or a million people in that one hour, that's got to be better than having five one-hour meetings because you then just get the people. It's like a pipeline. As yeah. I mean, I'm teaching too. This is the stuff you teach. That it's it's pipeline. The more people you can feed in, yeah. it's the low-hanging fruit. And I just saw lots of speakers 10 years ago, and I was terrified of public speaking, is there'd always be 10 or 20 people that would run up to the speaker afterwards and you don't have to worry about the other 80%. Just concentrate on the ones that are super keen, ready to, to buy. Yeah, right. Leverage of your time, it's got to be the best thing in the world. And that's something that you have absolutely mastered. So you built a, a, a quite a decent-sized property portfolio. It's, it's about 15 million. About 15 yep. million. Um, what period of time is it taking you to do that? Uh, so I started at 22. Yep. I got to about 3.5 million at 31 and basically got out of Deloitte's then. Yep. Um, when and had some fun and then just built the portfolio a tiny bit from there. Yeah, right. So again, look, there's plenty of people that have got 100 times the size of that. But my whole thing was is what's the biggest portfolio I can build for doing the less amount, least amount yeah, of work amount of and work. having fun? Yeah, which I think is a really key question. You know, what's the, what's, the, what's the greatest amount of wealth that I can create to do the least amount of work so I can do the things that I love? Yeah. Which I think is a really intelligent question. And so a lot of my clients are kind of – I call kind of high net worth. So they might earn a couple of hundred grand. So a lot of people probably don't realize you're actually a buyer. You're an investor, but you're also, you buy on behalf of other investors as well. Yeah. So effectively what happened is I got out of Deloitte at 31 and that's because I tried to salary salary sacrifice a Ferrari. (laughs) And and first of all, they didn't know my name and they worked out the FBT, the tax on it was more than my wages. (laughs) And they said, oh, what are you buying this car for? And I said, oh, just to hang around at the weekends and race a bit. And because they didn't know my name, I was so low down in Deloitte's, they knew something was funny was going on. So that raised a lot of questions. So people said, oh, how come you don't work, you drive a Ferrari, you've got a boat, you live on the beach, and you're not working? And so I started teaching them. And because I didn't sell anything, because I didn't have a job, then people believe what I said, because I'm just telling a story just like we're talking now. And then basically from there, I then put it into courses, then did some TV stuff, which effectively was for free as well. And then people said, look, can you just do it for me? I don't mm. want to deal with the agents and all the rest of it. So effectively, the business was built out of just a, a, a consumer demand mm. to say, I want to buy property. I'm happy paying you a fee because it's better than me bec- spending 10,000 hours to be that expert. Yeah. And I love the way that you, and because I've seen this from the very beginning, like the way that you've built your business is just through that psychology of giving. And I, and I know that necessarily hasn't, Oh, look, I don't know what the intent has been, but one of the things that I've seen you is you, you know, you would show up to the opening of an envelope to speak, you know, as long as there was a group of people who would listen. And there's a bar. And there's a bar and there's beer. You know, the way that you put yourself forward at, um, you know, Sky Sky News and you put yourself on TV and Sky News, you, you were very, you've been incredibly proactive to put yourself into the right places at the right time to meet the right people. But you've done it based on the basis of giving, giving first. Sure. So look, I, I was brought up 
that way anyway. So my mum's father was a vicar in the, in the country in the UK, so charity and all that stuff. And so my dad effectively worked, he worked for the National Health Service, so he wasn't like private doctor, yeah, right. earning lots of money. Everything was about giving to the community. And even when he retired, then he, he carried on working, doing the same thing anyway. Hmm. So part of that's just in built into us. But I guess I enjoy it. There's, I could never understand why anyone would be a teacher at school. You think they get abused and insulted and they don't earn any money. Why would you want to be a teacher? But then when you get a stranger coming up to you saying, I read your book 10 years ago, I went to a seminar seven years ago, this is what I put into practice, there's no better feeling in mm. the world. And you would, I mean, I'm not doing mass volume. You're, you're, you're teaching a lot of people at live seminars and you're looking at the results that they've got as well. And it's an amazing feeling. Mm. And so I would say 80% of what I do, I do for free. And a lot of it you could say, oh, effectively it's all marketing and you're getting the customers, which, which is true as well. But the majority of my time I do for free, and I haven't sent you an invoice for this podcast yet. <laughs> um, very expensive. Um, and then I know I'll get business off the back of it. Mm. And even if I, I don't, I don't care, to be honest. Yeah. Because all my wealth is coming from my property portfolio, which mm. now is a good position and the market's moved, so I don't need money as much. I would rather work for free and never have to sell. because And this is where you could probably teach me because I still think of selling and my mind turns. As soon as I think I'm selling, I hate it. Mm. And I clinch up and I'm an accountant and I hate it. But if I'm in flow, I'm not selling. Mm. And I'm just saying, take it or leave it. This is what I do. If you like what I do, I can help you. If you don't, don't worry about it. Do whatever you think's best. Mm. And part of that's a luxury that I'm not in the position that I've, I have to get their business. Yeah. And that's what makes you influential because there yeah. is no desperation. It's very deliberate. Um, and, you know, I, th I think it's fair to say that you live in a very, like I don't hear you use the terminology very often like abundance, you know, or lack. You know, that's that's a term that probably some of the other boys would, would use. You know, I don't know the big words. Yeah, yeah I know. I'll spell words. it for you. I'll break it down. <laughs> but um, one of the things that I've, I've noticed about you, Chris, is you are quite abundant naturally, you know, and I didn't I didn't actually know about your, your, your grandfather being the vicar and, and your dad yeah, yeah. Um, being as charitable as what he was. That makes a lot of sense now. But you are very, and again, I'm going to ask a question in a moment, but you are very abundant through observation. Like you do give a lot. And I've always said throughout all the boys, you know, up until, you know, probably two years ago, you've always been the one guy that no matter what, you know, you'd always be the one following up and saying, how are you going? You know, come out for a beer. And, and you know, I, to the point where, you know, I've been I, trying to get you out for beers for ten years. <laughs> yeah, I know. You have one night out and you take a week off. <laughs> but it's, you, it's called um, practice. Like I know, running mate, a marathon, you've got but, to practice. I know. But my point being is, you just you, you are very generous with your intention, uh, with your attention to people in terms of giving people connection. You are very abundant in terms of the way that you give because you just have this understanding that'll come back. But I'm curious to know, is there anything conscious about that or is that just how you're wired? Like, do you have this understanding that everything will just take care of itself? Is that a part of your psychology? Can I get a copy of this recording so I can play it to the boys with all these compliments? <laughs> <laughs> so, look, I think it's pretty much natural that that's just the way I'm, like, I want to be liked, like most people. I love being sociable. I love being out there. And I'm talking about myself, like my favourite subject. <laughs> and so... I'm not, my repertoire isn't big, so I know nothing about sports. I know nothing about politics and I've got no interest. And so in general conversations, I'm not the loudest person in the room because I haven't necessarily got that much to say. But if it's around property, I can be underwater, mm. drunk, midnight, two in the morning, and I can still talk property and I love it. And people would say, your eyes light up as soon as you're talking about it. Mm. And that's my love, that's my passion just like someone else, it might be football or, or whatever. And so I just love talking about it and I love giving and I love sharing. And if I never have to charge someone a cent for the rest of my life, I'm happy. Yeah. But at the same time, I only want to do it to people that's grateful. Mm. So this is the whole thing with a lot of seminars and stuff is you need to charge because otherwise you get all the time wasters along and I don't want to spend my life at time wasters. Mm. If If people have got a genuine need and they think I can give something, I'll give it to them. And the money doesn't even come into it. Nice. Uh, and I just need some good marketing around that. Well, you know, anyway. you know, it's hard to market you know this kind of a product when you really yeah, look at it. So yeah, to try and market honesty in real estate, <laughs> yeah, seriously well, tough. It is disruptive it, because everyone says, "Oh yeah, and no, I'm honest," and the rest of it. And I actually yeah. spoke at an Amex function to I think 300 of their top performers, and they said, "What's your USP?" 
and I said, look, I've got something that no one's ever going to copy in real estate. I'm honest and I do what I say I'm going to do <laughs> and no one's ever going to copy that. <laughs> so why property? Why, why, why that asset class? So story was, so I basically finished school at 18. I came to Australia and um, uh, stayed here for three, three and a half months. I had no money. I was deep in debt. I started a courier business in London. I think I started off um, borrowing three and a half thousand pounds. And by the time I'd worked for six months, I was five thousand pounds in debt. <laughs> so it wasn't the best business guy around town, but I loved driving. Came back to the UK. Mum gave me a curfew at midnight. So you're the courier in Australia? I know in, in, in the, the UK. UK. Then came. I was, I was delivering to all the the labels to all the fashion shops. Right. So I, I had to deliver all the labels to all the the hot hot girls in the thing, and I was the kind of kind of uh, weedy uh, courier guy, but it was good fun. <laughs> so I came back to the UK. Mum gave me a curfew to come back from the pub, and I said, Mum, I've not come back by midnight. I've come back from Australia. I, I should be able to get back from the local pub. She said, No, it's my house. My, my rules. rules. Back by midnight. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's when I said that was my catalyst to say I need to move out. And that's the thing is it's all for a reason. And we were just brought up that you buy your own home. That's that's the way of life in, in for most people in the UK. And so that's when I went down the route. And look, I was lucky enough we'd inherited, I think, £10,000. Um, and we weren't allowed to spend it, but we could invest it. And if we made a profit, then we could spend the proceeds. So I basically had that as a deposit for a property. But again, it's my logic of rather than borrow 30 grand because I only earned 10,000 then, I could actually have the logic of, of trying to borrow more. And then I went to my dad almost with a business plan to say, look, if I do the normal thing, I'm going to live in a terrible property in the worst part of town and mum's going to hate you for it. Whereas <laughs> if I buy this three-bedroom house in the really cool part of town with all the yuppies and the rest of it, then I can rent two rooms out and live for free. So I'm not after a handout, dad, but I just need you to, to guarantee the mortgage. And obviously my parents would bail me out, but it, it wasn't the handout thing. So they wouldn't give money. They expect us to work for it. Yeah, nice. And they're not materialistic. They don't want new cars. Like my dad died with a 24-year-old Golf that had been ridden off and he said, no, I can repair it. So I didn't come from that kind of money, but they would obviously support us if we were doing something. And the logic made so much sense. Buy a decent property in a decent area, rent two rooms out and live for free versus buy a crappy one in a bad part of town. Yeah, right. So why property, like as an investment strategy, Great. That, that's great to see here you have got into it, but let's say, you know, mum and dad, Joe Bloggs, young guy, young girl, middle-aged, regardless, we're looking at becoming wealth or we're looking to invest. Yeah. We've got shares. So why know, should they choose property? Why property? So look, in, in hindsight is it's that safe bricks and mortar. If you buy good property in good parts of any capital city, generally it's always performed because most people live in it as a family home and so even if times are really tough they don't get, they'll make the mortgage repayment it's the first thing you always do um it's then having the leverage that generally is the first home buyer you can probably get a 95 percent mortgage so your 50 grand could buy you a million dollar property that's amazing leverage and the only reason the banks would give that kind of leverage is because they know it's bricks and mortar and it's solid they're not going to lend you 95% of it if they think it's going to drop in value, which is why with most shares, they're only going to lend you 50%. Mm -hmm. So if the banks are telling you this stuff, learn from the banks. Like if someone's lending lots of money, it's got to be reasonably secure. And again, the government can't have property go down. Like it's the worst thing that they, they want to do. They'll change anything to stop the property market dropping, whereas, again, they're not going to do that on shares. And then it's the time leverage as well. So I've got 14 properties. I reckon it takes me 30 minutes a month maximum to manage them. So I've got an Excel sheet. I could count my 14 rents coming in, my 14 mortgages going out, and maybe I'll get an email a month saying, oh, dishwasher's broken. Do you mind if we replace it? And I say, look, under $1,000, just go and fix it. Maybe over that, send me an email. But it's passive management because whatever I do will change dollars and cents, whereas by buying another property could make me another 50 or 100 grand a year. So you mm. need to think big picture. Yeah, right. So, look, I guess some people are going to hear this and go, well, it's all right for you. You were in an accountant at Deloitte. You know, it's all right for this guy. He was making a bit of money. But some people are able to build, you know, substantial property portfolios, in some cases on very little income. But what I'm curious to know is can you become comfortably wealthy with a passive investment strategy or do we actually need to be a little bit entrepreneurial and treat property investment a little bit like a business? 
So I think any investment should be like a business and you should treat it like a business because it can very easily earn more money than you can. Mm. So that's why you need to treat it seriously. So when people buy their homes, they buy it very well and they generally always make money because they're buying it for themselves. They see 50 or 100 properties, they understand the prices and and the areas and then they go and fly into state for the weekend or overseas and go and buy a whole, uh, an apartment in Thailand or in Gold Coast or something like that. And so they make little decision because they're not touching and feeling it and having to deal with it. And so I think if you do treat it like a business and get your advisors and do all this stuff, whether you're on a 10 grand income or a million dollars, doesn't matter. There's still so much education. There's so much free education that there is no excuse these days for not being um, educated around property. And sure, I'm an accountant, but I wasn't a great accountant. Like I failed tax three times and I'm just good with basic numbers but you can pay someone 30 bucks an hour or your mortgage broker can do mm. your numbers for you. There is no excuse. And there's there's people I've had on my show that are in their 30s, western suburbs of Sydney, not highly educated, not from a wealthy background, but they've got five jobs and their portfolio is probably 10 times as big as mine. Mm. So there's always a person. But it comes down to your why, mm. which I'm sure you've been to a 1,000 seminars as well. It's what is your reason. If your reason is not compelling enough, you're not going to do it. But if you really want something, either if you're scared of being poor and having a job and not having any money, or you're motivated by, um, I guess, material things, doesn't matter. I'm, I'm motivated by both. So I, I kind of get some money. I can't sleep because it's in the bank. I'm not making most of it. So I invest it plus a bit. So I overinvest. Then I feel poor that I'm going to have to get a job. So then I work really, really hard <laughs> to earn some money. <laughs> I then get the money, can't sleep, reinvest it. Yeah. So my biggest issue is I've overinvested. Yeah. And so hence the haircut, which if it's an audio <laughs> you can't see, but I've got too much hair, because I've basically kept pushing the limits beyond what I should have done. Yeah. But I knew the risk I was taking, so I was willing to take extra risk to do it in, say, half the time. Then you can do it slow and steady, still wins the race. So yep. you don't have to. You can still keep your hair and not be stressed. Well, you've done this through, you know, an incredible um, period of economic prosperity in Australia. Would you advise that to someone who's perhaps listening now? Like, should they follow that kind of overinvesting strategy for the next 10, 15 years? So look, a lot of people say, oh, you've had record prices or it's been good <clears throat> times. And I think it's like, whatever, it's, I've had ups and downs and I've paid 10 or 11% interest. Sure, other people have paid 20 in the 80s. But everyone's always got an excuse. And I think they're just excuses. Mm. Um, the bottom line is if you want it to work, it can work. And if you don't want it to work, it's not going to work. Go and buy some shares. See how you go with those. You're right. Um, is I still have serious issues to get around. Like the borrowing in Australia at the moment is really, really tough. And so me and my business partner, we went around 10 second tier lenders to say, right, we want to build a product just for people like us that are buying blue chip properties, good areas, we got all the income, but we don't want to necessarily follow all the bank rules because we're more educated or more sophisticated than the average person in Australia buying the average property for 50 or 100 grand. And so we're trying to break the rules. Then we're going to ultra high net worth people. So these are like hundreds of millions of people. Uh, sorry, they've got hundreds of millions of dollars. And we're saying, look, you've got all this money sitting in the bank at 2%. We're paying four or five at the bank and we're getting all this grief and they're trying to get us to show more income and all these kind of things. How about we pay you six? Sure, I'm paying an extra percent, but then I don't have to push all my income early, like lose my expenses, play around with all my accounts and pay tax early. And I don't have to deal with the grief. And you're earning an extra 4% on your money and you understand a Bondi unit for a million dollars is safe as houses, 80% lent. So it's trying to do a joint venture with people to say, what have I got? What has someone else got? What have mm. they not got? What have I not got? And let's do something two plus two can equal five and we yeah, can right. all be winners. Yeah, right. And you're not successful straight away. It might take us six or 12 months. But if there's a will, there's a way. You just carry on doing it. So what do you see as the number one biggest mistake that people make when they want to get into property? I don't do anything. <laughs> that's, that's the bottom line. Right. Is they're trying to get high capital growth. They're trying to get high rental yields. They're trying to get low interest rates. Easy to borrow money from the bank and easy to buy property. And in 25 years, I've never had those five things. Mm. So they're waiting for the perfect time. Otherwise, oh, I'm not going to do it now. It's too hard to borrow. Oh, I'm not going to do it in two years' time because interest rates are too high. Oh, there's no growth at the moment. There's always a reason not to do it, and I believe it's excuses. Mm. Sure, maybe 1% is genuine, 
but I reckon the rest of it, without trying to call people out, yeah. everyone's got an excuse. If there were two other mistakes that people made when it comes to getting started and investing in property, what would they be? Then trying to make too much money. Mm, agreed. So they'll do the off the plan, they'll do the super high risk. So we just had um, a seminar just now. One of the guys said he had 1.2 million. So he's a business guy, got 1.2 million to invest, which is a nice sum of money. And he said his other business partner's telling him to do some developing and and to go and buy a house and put some townhouses on. I said, how much of that have you done before? Never done it in my life. What do you know about that? Don't know anything about it. So why is your first investment and your time poor? You haven't even got time because you're running a business. Would you go and do that? Versus buy that Bondi one that's, sure, it's not going to be half price. It's, it's not going to double overnight, but it might go up at 5 or 10% and give you a nice return for no time, no effort, and no risk. Mm. So people don't like the nice, safe, simple. And so I haven't done anything super clever. I've done a few renovations and stuff. The biggest thing I've done to make my money is I just did it, mm. and I kept repeating. So I, th I think greed is, is, is a massive thing. And then I think probably the other thing is listening to friends and family, mm. which obviously they're all there trying to protect us, they want to do the right thing. But unless they're super wealthy and they go get us and have done stuff, when do you ever get an, an entrepreneur saying, don't do that? No, that's too risky. If you surround yourself by positive people, they never put you down. And I say, give it a go. If you make a mistake and you lose some money, at least you knew in advance that you were taking that risk. So you're better off trying it than not trying it. Yeah, right. Property investing myths. What's the biggest one? Oh, that's a tough one. Myths. Um, I guess all properties go up. Mm -hmm. I guess all of them probably do in time, but not in the in the short term. So people think you can buy anything and then the market moves, which in the good times it does. But now in Australia, depending on what when people are listening to this, it is a changing market. So I think some properties are going to be dropping 10% and some are rising 10%, yeah, and right. some do nothing. Okay. So lots of different areas there. So it is about the quality of assets that you buy as well. With um, property prices obviously going nuts all over the world, not just in Sydney, also London, Vancouver, yeah. New York. So I still don't think it's nuts. I think it's good growth, but I don't think it's above and beyond normal. Okay. Well, I guess it depends on which headline you're reading sure. on what day. Yeah, and that's, um, the, that's the other thing. Don't read the papers. Don't read the papers. Which and is... don't listen to the news, so even on my show. So <laughs> someone's Sky except, for news your, every week. except for your show. No, no, I even said that. Don't worry about it. Nothing's changed. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so I do Sky every week. I write for the papers, do the radio, to do lots of this stuff. And I say, yeah, most of it don't listen to it. It's all marketing. You know, we talk about how hard it is for, you know, people to break into the Sydney market or the London market or the Vancouver market. And there are, you know, there are even some, you know, sensationalists saying that, you know, we've got this generation of millennials who are coming through that will never own a home. Um, so what we're starting to hear about now in Sydney is fractional property Fractional ownership, ownership yeah. Fractional ownership. And what I'm curious to know from you, first of all, for the people who don't know what it is, what is fractional property investment um, and what are your thoughts on it? Yeah. And look, it is a changing world as we've seen mm. with Airbnb and Uber and stuff like that. So, And look, I'm one of them. So I'm a renter. I, I haven't lived in my own home for maybe 10 years and I don't think we ever will and we never want to. Mm. But the reason slightly different with us is because I want to rent a 5 or $10 million home, I can rent it for 1% or 2% because there's no market it. So how many people can afford the million dollar Bondi? Everyone. You rent it out in the middle of the summer, price goes through the roof because they're all bidding against each other. So the rents are nice and high, normally four or five percent. Whereas say you take a five or ten million dollar property, not many people can afford that. Of the people that can afford it, they don't want to rent it because poor people rent. That's the social stigma. If you're the boss of a big bank or something, you don't want to tell everyone that you rent, everyone will think you're mad. But the price goes down. So quite often I, w I worked out whatever I could afford to buy, if I was in the right price bracket, I could have somewhere three or four times more expensive for the same money. Mm. So I'd rather five $1 million units and go and rent a $10 million home than go and buy my own $5 million home. But look, the, the fractional ownership. Before you go on, yep. because I remember you gave me that piece of advice. It was about 12 yeah. years ago. And did it, you listen? Yeah, I did. Good. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, as a result, you know, I've it's 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 been really helpful. But I, I guess a lot of people don't look at property that way. They, they do think about the rental stigma. It's, it's the stigma. And yeah. so I still do it. So they call it rent vesting now. So if yep. people want to Google it, do rent vesting. It literally only came out a couple of years ago is, is the main name. And I do it at the seminars and I'm probably maybe – 
the country's probably most famous renter because I'm a big advocate yep. of it and I talk about it all the time. And I still get up at seminars and I say, does anyone know who hasn't been to a seminar before, why would I want to rent? And the excuse is, oh, wait till you get married. That'll change. And it does, but didn't for that. When you have kids, when kids go to school. Again, it's all the excuses. They're trying to justify their own position for not doing it. Yeah. And sure, if you want to build your nest and you hate change, worst thing in the world. But if you want to embrace change, so every time we move, we move to a better place. So it's a positive experience. They say moving stressful. Well, we go on holiday. The removalist pack it, they move it, they unpack it, the cleaner comes in, makes the beds, puts the teddies in place, 90% done. Where's the stress in that? <laughs> so if you always move to better places and you get an extra holiday, it's a positive experience. I swear to God, you are like a lifestyle concierge. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, I hate it. So. A lifestyle designer. You're not a property investor, you're a lifestyle designer. I think, I think if you tell yourself enough, you yeah. start believing it yourself as well. Yeah, well, you really are. And you know, you're notorious as the... As the you know, as the one who's designed the most incredible life, fractional property investment. And then we should talk about flying business and first for free as well. Oh, gosh, I'm sure we could do that. <laughs> uh, fractional ownership. So the concept here is that a lot of people can't afford to live in the place that they want straight away. Because we started seeing this with sports cars. You had the sports car club come in. Yeah, super people club. Doing super car club. Yeah. We started seeing that with the boat club and the luxury cruiser yeah. clubs. So with, with the things like the boat's probably a really good example because they say if you don't use it every day, why pay for it every day? Mm. And having an eighth of a boat in 40 days, even if you had 100% of the boat, you wouldn't use it more than 40 days anyway. Yep. So when it comes to, to property, one of the angles they use is if you had a million dollars to invest in the share market, you wouldn't put it into one share, would you? You'd obviously spread it across a few shares. So why would you do the same in property? And another thought process is, say you only had, say, 100 grand in super, for instance, mm -hmm. and you wanted to buy a house, you'd have to buy one like 500 miles away or 1,000 miles away. So would you rather that or effectively 10% of a Bondi unit? And to me, I'd rather 10% of a Bondi unit because I think it's a good suburb, good area, and good investment. So this is the idea. So they say, go and rent your house wherever you want to go and do it. And then almost like Monopoly, buy lots of little 50 grand investments or even five or one grand investments in good quality assets. How's that being organized? Like if someone wanted to get into fractional property investment, how, how would they do that? Sure. So there's three web portals that are doing it, and yep. maybe there'll be more in the future. So at the moment, uh, Domacom, BrickX, and a new one coming up is called Covesta. Right. And they've probably got their all pros and cons, or they do slightly different things. Um, but effectively, they're a marketplace. So if you then want to get out of your share, there's a marketplace for it. Yeah, right. And again, you'd have to make certain assumptions about whether you could get out, depending on how much money you've got in there. But I think the, the overall thing is assume you're in there for maybe seven years and maybe in the unit trust that they hold then the property gets sold after seven years unless everyone agrees. Um, but the chances are you might get your money out within a few hours, just like the stock market if you want to sell. Right. Because it is something so new, is there anything that people should be wary of or should be cautious of? Like sure. should they be cautious of going, well, shit, I'll just chuck it in there for 12 hours and 24 hours and see how I go? Like. Yeah, so I think property is a long-term game of because course. you've still got the cost of getting in and out, which is so high. Yeah. So would I do it? No, I wouldn't, but because I can afford to do it myself. Yeah. Right. And the downside of it, at the moment, there's no leverage. So if you put 100 grand in, you only get 100 grand. Whereas if you could get a 90% loan as a first home buyer, you could buy a million-dollar property. Mm. Now, if that rises at 10%, you've just doubled your money. Mm. So um, I don't like it more from the leverage perspective, but say from a super... So I think my wife's got 100 grand in super. I've got none because I haven't really done a proper job. And so I'd rather she buys, say, 10% of a Bondi unit than we have 100 grand in shares. Not because I don't believe in shares, but I just don't understand them. I've got no interest in them. Yeah, right. Of course. So I think it's horses for courses. And one interesting, one of the guys or one of these um, portals, they're saying, say, if you want, you're a renter and you want effectively the investors to buy your property you can put your own property effectively up on the um, the listing to say, I'm the tenant, I'll buy a 5% share and I'm going to look after it because I'm a shareholder, hmm. which is a pretty cool idea, I think. Yeah, very cool. So that for some people would be a great way to get into the market, especially if yeah, they don't do have, something. Yeah. yeah. But there would be some limitations like you've already discussed. You probably wouldn't be able to access the equity to leverage the equity in, in, in fractional ownership. Yeah, so I think one of them you might be able to borrow after the effect. So you've right. got a, a unit that's maybe worth 50 grand, so maybe you can borrow in, in arrears or in hindsight with that. Gotcha. The other ones, maybe they can buy a hundred grand or a million dollar property for 600. Yep. So maybe 
your kind of 50 grand share or your 30 grand share effectively gets you a 5% okay. share in it. So, again, these things will change over time. So you've got to look into it. You've got to get financial advice and accountant and all that kind of stuff. So let's say I'm a beginner. I've looked at Fraction. I'm like, I don't, I'm, I'm a little bit better off. I can do I can do better than – look, I want, to, I want to get into it. I don't want to do the Fractional. Uh, let's say I'm earning, call it 75 to 150 grand a year. I've maybe saved a deposit of somewhere between thirty and $100,000. If someone wants to get into property investing, where is the best place for them to start? So look, I think the safest thing is, say, Sydney to start with. Right. And I think that because – But if they were listening to this and say in Canada or in England okay. or in the US. Sure. Yep. So so the main thought is is stick to major capital cities right. where there's lots of different industries supporting it. Yep. So if mining goes down or tourism or something like that, it doesn't shut down the whole market. Just like we know manufacturing plants shut down or mining towns yep. and then there's it's a dead town. So lots of industries supporting it. Normally, I avoid the CBD because there's no limit of supply. You can keep building all these tall towers. So look, where you're in Hong Kong, Singapore, you know there's lots of, of them there. Most of the locals in other parts of the world don't want to live there. And so typically you're going 5 to 15 Ks maybe or, or maybe further in other cities because that's where normally you get three-story height limits. So the councils don't want massive high-rises. All the houses are built up or units are built up next to each other. So if you've got no more supply of property... And that's the demand from all the young professionals that earn mm. good money, normally 25 to 35-year-old young professionals because they haven't got cars and kids and all of this kind of expense. They've got a high disposable income and that can push property prices and rents up. And normally if you're buying secondhand, you're not getting some fancy developer selling you that kind of brand new car that's worth less as soon as you drive it off the forecourt. Mm. Effectively the same thing is, is they sell it based on uh, depreciation benefits or tax benefits, but because it's so beautiful, people are paid an emotional price. Whereas you buy that ugly old property that Joe Blow is selling and he hasn't hired the best agent and the best marketing campaign, you're much more likely to buy a right property at a reasonable price. So what would you say to someone who says, oh, shit, that's kind of different to the advice that I, I, I received or the book that I read? and I From I, that financial planner that's making a fortune off something else that is slightly biased. <laughs> well, it's that interesting. Kind of idea? Yeah, that kind of yeah. idea because a lot of people are told, you know, oh, well, if you can't afford the you know the, the ca those capital city markets, go to those new markets, go to those emerging markets, go to those coastal areas that are, that are starting to develop. Uh, yeah. and, and what are the biggest challenges you see there? So even the best experts in the country – find it very hard to pinpoint exactly the highs and lows of those markets, mm. almost like stock picking. Yep. So if you've never invested in the stock market before, should you go and invest in dot-coms and techie companies where you've got maybe one in 10 or one in 100 chance of doing it? Or should you buy some blue chip stock that's been mm. nice and stable that's grown at 3 to 7% over the last 20 years? Is, come on, if you've got no experience, buy something safe and solid don't go start developing when you've got no experience. Yeah, because it's, it's interesting. And I think sometimes it's very easy for people not to hear when you say, because you drop the word blue chip properties all the time. Right. Um, and what you mean by blue chip properties is exactly that. Is is solid. Yeah. Been there for a long time. Not not super expensive. Yep. So it's kind of 80% within the median price. So if the median price is a million, you want to be investing 800 to 1.2 because it really means the average person in that local area can afford to buy it or rent it. So there's lots of demand. So just like we were talking with fractional ownership, you don't want to be stuck with something you can't sell. Um, and the market in that 80% band around the median price doesn't really change too much. Yeah, right. So let's say you've got a you know you've got a high performer. You know you've got a superhuman guy, girl. They don't want to they don't want to muck around. They don't want to wait. You know, ten years to build, or twelve years, or fifteen years to build a fifteen million dollar portfolio. They want to build a fifteen million dollar portfolio in the next five years or seven years, um, and maybe that's unrealistic, and it probably is for most people. But let's just assume that someone wanted to accelerate property investment and become wealthy faster than the average bear. What would you suggest to someone who's got that kind of a kink? So I would generally give them reality check mm. and tell them that: Do you want to be guaranteed to say have ten or fifteen in? X amount of years, not that there's any guarantees, and obviously we're not giving advice on this podcast, um, or do you want to punt it that you've either got nothing or you've got 30 million? Yeah. So I'm very much an advocate of slow and steady wins the race, the hair and the tortoise. Slow is fast. Yeah. Yeah. So, but saying that, I'd say you're better off, rather than taking the risk with the property investments, take the risk with your job. So you work, you concentrate on earning more money 
and finding more deposits, I'll get your properties working as hard as I can, ideally, you get back to work. Mm. Or you find someone else that can lend you your next million dollar deposit. Mm. So maybe you talk to your parents. Now, you might not want help from your parents. And and say this is even first home buyers. So say someone's got nothing. People say, I don't want help from my parents. I want to do it myself. Okay, well, that's fine. If you do it by yourself, it might take you 10 years. You could do it with your parents straight away. You could do a joint venture where you both win so you're not after a handout and you both make money and you do it in half the time. Mm. So there's smarter ways of doing it. So like joint ventures. Well, it kind of goes back to, you know, I said one of the top three mistakes I said when people make when they're trying to build property and you said doing moving too quickly. I think that was yeah. the response you gave, which, which kind of nails that right on the head. Um, you know, another question a lot of people ask when it comes to investment is, you know, how long should they hold an investment for? You know, because some people, you know, hear the word trade and they go, oh, well, I want to, you know, I want to flip properties and trade properties or I want to flip this and do that. But when it comes to a solid property investment, what, what should be the hold strategy? So they just want to go out and get a business card that says property developer on it because then they're really cool. Yeah, right. In the wine bar. Is that a cool thing these days? I don't know. All the Probably kids are not. doing it, right? <laughs> but that's the kind of thing is they're keeping up with the Joneses type yep. thing. They want to be super cool. And I've got a whole bunch of ugly properties, but they make money, so who cares what they are? Um, so I think the – actually, what was the question? How long should someone hold a property? Oh, yeah. um, so I think if you buy the right investment, why would you ever sell it? Mm. Because the numbers with property is you're obviously paying capital gains tax, which is maybe 25 to 50% depending on where you are in the world. Is this And there's quite often 5% cost to get into the market. You throw away all the profits, whereas – a concept which non-property investors won't understand, but the concept of refinancing is effectively you sell to the bank, you buy it back the same day, quite often you can pull out 80% of the equity and you don't pay any costs. So say your property goes from half a million to a million. You then go back to the bank, say my property is worth a million bucks. They say, well, assuming you can afford to repay it, we'll lend you 800 grand. You only borrowed 400 originally, so here's a bank account for 400 grand that you can then use as deposit and costs on your next properties. Mm. Whereas if you go and sell it, so one of my properties I made a million dollars in three and a half months and not, nice little development. But if I'd sold it, I'd have paid 500 grand in capital gains. I would have spent about 100 grand selling it and 200 grand to rebuy. So out of my million bucks, I would have been there for 200 grand. Mm. Whereas by refinancing, I had 800 grand in cash and my other 200 grand of equity was still sitting there and I maybe paid five or 10 grand in costs. And then you were able to go and leverage that 800 grand into exactly. another eight million. And so effectively, I put money into a block of units. I pulled all the money out, plus I had an extra 300 over, which was then a buffer or a working capital to cash flow for the next 10 or 20 years. So it's these simple things. So a lot of people I've met, say builders and developers, they'll come to me and say, oh, Chris, can you find me some properties? I've been, I think I'm doing really well, but I've got no money to show for it. They were buying properties for maybe 500, putting 50 in and selling it for 600, which is great. You're making 50 grand. But it's cost them 50 grand in cost because mm. there's like 25 grand in stamp duty. There's maybe 10 or 15 grand to sell it. And so suddenly there's no money left. But they just haven't worked out on paper that there is no money. So whatever way you do it is still not going to turn around. If it doesn't make money on paper, it doesn't make any money. You've worked with a lot of investors, you know, all shapes and sizes. Um, you know, I know some of your clients have been, you know, very successful entrepreneurs with huge portfolios and other of your clients have just been, you know, normal everyday mums and dads and even, you know, Johns and Janes. Uh, but the question of God is, is with everyone that you've worked with, have you observed that there are certain psychologies that seem to do better? And this is really moving towards, is there a certain psychology, is there a certain mindset that's required to really be successful as a property investor? No, I think, as you say, there's a wide different range of people from mm. education to money to backgrounds and and no. And some of my favourite clients are in their 20s from Perth and actually two of them got engaged. So they both bought a property separately, then bought another two and then they got engaged. So, mm. um, so it's a nice cool story. But a whole different range of people. The ones that we find do well are the decision makers that trust the process. Mm. Now, there's a danger with this because... I think I'm trustworthy and I think I do the right thing and our investment strategy isn't high risk. So people trusting me, I think is a good thing. But you go and put your trust into the wrong person and they can screw you completely. 
out there. Mm. So it's very hard. So some people are, we give our opinions on <laughs> what we should do and they don't listen and they want to do the complete opposite thing. And it's, well, what's the point? So I had a great example. Someone wanted two bedrooms, two bathrooms. So normally it's two bed, one bath. They wanted the extra bathroom. And they said, well, that make more money. Sure, look, a lot of people would like it and it's a nice selling point. It took them a year to find something and they didn't even make a decision then. In that time, the market moved 100 grand. No matter what you did, even if you bought the lemon on day one versus wait a year, having an extra bathroom is not going to make you 100 grand over the lifetime of the property. Mm. And that's the thing is, is people are, are worried about the dollars and cents, they miss the big picture. And so most of the time I'd say you're better off jumping in today rather than waiting for a renovation or the perfect thing because it's not going to come come around. And by the time it comes around, you're going to pay twice the price. So there's people at all different price levels that will make decisions and trust the process and others mm. won't. And we put, I say don't even trust me. Don't trust anyone in our company. So look, we're only going to buy in blue chip suburbs so you know we're not trying to pick the latest, greatest thing. We say let's get an independent valuation from a bank or bank valuer as to what it's worth. So don't even trust us what it's worth. And let's not pay 50 bucks for this valuation or 100 bucks like the bank does. Let's pay 660 bucks. Let's get someone to spend two or three hours doing the research and you can sue them. They're professionally qualified to do it. Plus a building inspector, strider inspector. So I think I've put all the things in place so that you're not actually trusting me. We're just facilitating it. Yeah, right. And some people will go through with that and say... We make it so hard for ourselves versus our competition to buy because we're trying to do it on a conservative bank vale. And some people still won't trust the process. And look, maybe we haven't built the right trust. Maybe we haven't sold them right. Maybe they're just too anal and it's never going to work. So I think the thing is you can't help everyone. And if you're one of those anal people, sometimes you just need to get over yourself. Otherwise, mm. you'll never make a decision. Well, I think you hit some good points there. Decision makers who trust the process, you know, who trust people with more experience than themselves, you know, which is not a bad trait to have. Mate, um, as I said earlier, if there's one person that I would, if anyone ever came to me and said, how do I design the ultimate lifestyle where I can do whatever I want um, and, and, and have money and everything else, you'd be the guy that I'd point them towards. But I am curious, you know, with all the circles that you've mixed in, all the things that you've done, as we wrap the interview up, what's the best piece of advice that you've ever been given? Someone said, um, I did a course and it probably wasn't the most honest person around town, but it was good advice at the time. Was I remember this. invest one percent of your assets each year into re-educating yourself mm. or into professional advisors to either de-risk your portfolio to make sure you're not going to lose it, or to help increase it. That's pretty and, solid advice. Yeah, and so say if you've got a million dollar asset or a million dollar home, to spend ten grand on yourself, mm. and I know you're very pro education as well. Why wouldn't you spend five or ten grand a year? either doing personal development or getting advice around property or de-risking it. And so even in our business, we've just paid a guy six grand and I think he's done something like six kind of three-hour sessions with us. And the whole purpose of that six grand was either to de-risk our business in case an Uber or an Airbnb came around or to find us a new opportunity. So I run a business, a couple of million dollar turnover, nothing major, why wouldn't I invest six grand just to see if this guy's got an idea? Mm. And if he hasn't, I can sleep easy. At least I've got someone that didn't know anything about property to give me his honest opinion about what I could be doing. And maybe he's got an opportunity to de-risk it so my business isn't going to half tomorrow. Or maybe he's got an opportunity where I could double it tomorrow mm. or in the next five or ten years. And so me and my business partner were sitting down and he's drilling us everything about our business and it's interesting because I want to see, and this is why I put stuff out in the media. People say, oh, you've told everyone how much you turn over, how much you, you make, what your portfolio is. If you put it out there, people will question it and, and challenge it. That's how you learn. Whereas if you keep everything secret, that's why most people aren't knowledgeable about money because they don't tell people what they earn, what they spend. So how can you get good at money if you never talk about it? Mm. Mate, that's fantastic. You also wrote a book, um, one of which is uh, rated R and is is illegal to be printed in this country. <laughs> but the one that is available, w w what is it and where can people get it? So it's called The Effortless Empire. Turning your weekdays into weekends? No, that was the first one. Oh, that was so, the first so one. So the first one was called Go For Your Life, right. How to Turn Your Weekdays Into Weekends. That's right, yep. And that's no longer in print, so very hard to get. But if you come to one of our seminars or go on a newsletter or email me, we'll, yep. we'll give it away. 
Um, but the main one was, and that was basically how I retired at 31 and got out of work and did yep. joint ventures. The Empire book is really how to build a big portfolio. So this is the big picture. So even if you're a first home buyer, this is how to think big. You want to retire early. You want to make some money. This is how you do it. And 99% is education, so they can go off and, and put it into practice anywhere in the world. Um, simply, they, they go to yourempire.com.au or just Google me and it should come up. All they've got to do is put in an email and they they can download the PDF audiobook. So if any listeners can't read, yep. um, they can listen to it. Right. Obviously, if they're time poor and they, right. they awesome. need to listen. Um, and I think for $4.95, including GST, we'll even mail you one. Is that right? So I'm not even trying to profiteer out the book. So again, people would say, why would you give your book away for free? Well, I'd rather give, we probably do 10,000 hard copies, God knows how many soft copies. I'd rather do that for free and work on getting one client mm. than trying to sell 10,000 books for a few dollars. Yeah, right. And again, that was someone else that told me that, say $25, John, a $25 book or 25 grand client. And I said, well... I'd rather one twenty-five grand client. Bingo, Chris Gray. Thank you so much for your Been time, pleasure. mate. Real pleasure. There you have it, guys. Thanks for tuning in to Unstoppable with me, your host, Kerwin Ray. And do me a favor, don't forget to drop me a review on iTunes. Would love to hear what you think. I love reading what you guys have to say. And your reviews make sure we keep creating killer content just like this. If you want to stay up to date with me and all my movements, please jump onto the website, kerwinray.com. And also check us out on social media, at Kerwin Ray.